Space Show listeners, we're here with Buzz Aldrin. This is an American hero that needs no introduction. All of you know who he is. He's been a guest on our program before. Uh, he is what all of us strive to be and we want our children to be. Buzz, welcome back to the Space Show. How are you here at Yuri's Night? Uh, I'm feeling uh, very active because things have been going, I think, uh, in a very positive direction lately. I uh, am susceptible to uh, disappointments and disillusionments maybe more than others are. But I'm also susceptible to uh, getting buoyed up and, uh, when, when things look like they're, they're moving promising way. I just came from the uh, National Space Symposium in Colorado Springs and uh, man there were just a lot of very influential uh, people there and uh, before that I was in uh, in Washington with the uh, Horatio Alger uh, celebrations where they introduced some uh, very notable people into this organization which promotes scholarships for underprivileged people. <clears throat> so I uh, uh, have seen some turning around in some of the things that my Share Space Foundation is trying to do. Uh, and. Uh, and I think that I'm viewing, uh, after some consulting with NASA, the exploration people, a uh, growing receptivity of my thoughts on evolutionary lunar landers uh, beyond uh, two-stage uh, abort-to-orbit landers that will move toward lunar surface rendezvous and abort-to-land rovers that land much more capable and mobile operational habitats on the descent stage that then can be offloaded and, uh, and used each time we land someone on the surface. It does require that we have a lifeboat of sorts uh, on the lunar surface to be able to take people back up, but it's a much simpler uh, type uh, than the descent stage habitat that would be uh, offloaded. And I'm seeing some progress a little bit on uh, defining what I think is a growing importance to realize that uh, whether you go forward from low Earth orbit through the moon to Mars or you look at what you're doing at Mars and you figure out how we're going to get there, I think you come to the same conclusion that, uh, that American astronauts really know how to live in low Earth orbit. And we can operate robots very nicely, or if we can't, design robots for low Earth orbit, uh, we, we can get them working pretty well and then we can hire uh, foreign uh, astronauts, cosmonauts, that need more experience in low Earth orbit for their nation and their space program. And then we move on to the moon. Now we need to relearn uh, operations on the surface of the moon. Uh, we need to relearn them with an idea toward two things toward being more able to move on soon toward landing, operating, and growing permanence at Mars, but turning over at the moon habitation and permanence only if the commercial activities can pay for the high cost of habitation. I don't think the taxpayers should just continually pay for a government habitation on the moon if it can be done with robots. And I think with the short time delay to the moon that we can set things up and if we have a good transportation system in cis lunar space, if something breaks down on the commercial activities, whether it be a science, uh, astronomy, uh, experiment antennas or, or whatever it is, or if we're manufacturing uh, fuel, rocket fuel from the ice, the ice crystals that we may find that we can convert either on the surface or I think preferably by delivering ice to L1. That's the uh, libration point on the Earth side uh, of the moon that's in constant uh, daylight except when it's uh, eclipsed very rarely. That's probably a very good place to commercially get the energy to convert the ice, which is easy to move around in zero gravity, uh, into oxygen and hydrogen, and that's a good depot 
for delivering that back to the Earth as the moon moves around, and we deliver it back to Earth in a high ellipse that is going to be the uh, staging orbit that's aligned with the departure to go to Mars. So as, as the moon moves around and as the, the ellipse, and when they come into the alignment, why you leave L1 and go to the high ellipse staging area with the fuel that now is needed to depart. And when we're refueled, then we launch the crew from the Earth and the droids people in the staging orbit. Uh, I've, now, so we have commercially uh, activities going on the moon, and they're being paid for by the profits that are derived from the commercial operations. And I say nothing wrong with Dana Rohrbacher's zero gravity, zero tax, uh, which is really a subsidy by the government for activities that, that need a little bit of support. Uh, uh, but what I'm uh, gradually leading to is the uh, Degree, the, the desirability of not establishing an expensive habitation in low Earth orbit unless people are there for some commercial gain, like adventure travel in a Bigelow hotel or something else. Uh, and the same thing applies to the moon. Now, traveling to the moon for an adventure could be very expensive. <laughs> to make close the business case, that's going to be very tough for Hilton or Bigelow or anybody else. Maybe you can swing around the moon if you don't stop into lunar orbit. And you know that what that's called? That's called a lunar cycler. Well, that leads me to just reminding people that the best way to get to Mars is a Mars cycler that, uh, that I discovered in 1985. My goodness, that's 22, 23 years ago. Uh, and there have been a lot of nice refinements by the graduate students at Purdue University. And uh, one in particular is now uh, an employee at JPL doing a wonderful job. Uh, but when we go to Mars with humans, the investment is so great that we train people up to age 30 or something like that with basic training and the skills. And then we specialize uh, in, in what we need. And, and then they go on what I would call a PCS. Now, military guys know that that's a permanent change of station. Now, somebody reminded me that that may be a permanent change of planet. <laughs> uh, but you can also call it a one-way mission. And it, it sounded laughable years ago, but it's not laughable at all when you consider how much you put into the training and the economics of sending somebody there, bringing them back 18 months later before the next crew gets there. And these are only six person spacecraft. Let's say we need 60 people there, okay, to, to take care of the resources to become independent of the Earth so we don't have to be paying for supplies going all the way to permanence uh, on Mars. Well, it takes 22 plus years at, at six people every 26 months. Uh, you, you can do the math, maybe it's 23 years. Well, it's kind of simple, but, but it certainly is around that ballpark. And who knows what new developments, technical breakthroughs are going to happen when, since the time a person first gets to the moon until he uh, maybe has uh, an emergency need to return to Earth. But we also have to start thinking about uh, uh, how, how soon do we want to have nurseries and babysitters at Mars as it grows in, in permanence. The, and there's one other very interesting thought. If people are going there and, and they can't wait to get home, they get homesick and they get irritated easily. But if people are going there and they know when they get there, that's they're all together living as pioneers there. They're going to work together and there's going to be less friction among crew members. I don't think very many people have given that too much thought yet. <laughs>